Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video by Tomorrow's World called Three Dangerous Lies of Evolution. I feel like there's really no way this can't end up being an argument from consequences. The thing is, if evolution is true, then scientists lying about how it works are not evolution's fault, and it would ultimately be detrimental to those scientists' careers, as there is great incentive in science to turn over previous findings. Now, if evolution were false, maybe then you'd be able to point out the specifics of what it got wrong, but with over 150 years of science backing it up, it's going to take more than a half hour video by a non-expert to point out any significant problems. Anyway, my expectations are low, I expect to see something along the lines of evolution teaches that our lives have no meaning, or something. So let's see! The theory has been embraced by those who do not like the idea of a creator god. It has also been embraced by those who do like the idea of a creator god. It is well established at this point that there are people of many faiths who all accept evolution, some of whom are comfortable using the word creationist to describe themselves, as can be seen here on the Biologos page explaining what evolutionary creation is. So can we please stop with this entirely false dichotomy? Embracing evolution and the worldview associated with it has had powerful consequences for our society and our lives. And there it is. 43 seconds into his video, he appeals to consequences. What this tells me is that even if every word he says throughout the rest of the video is true, it's going to be entirely irrelevant to the question of whether or not evolution happens. But I can almost guarantee that most of what he's going to say is going to be, at best, a misrepresentation. The theory of evolution has been tweaked and adjusted over the last more than 150 years, but it remains the predominant biological theory of our time. Yes, and it does get tweaked and adjusted to accommodate new data. And at each step along the way, the new data had the potential to falsify at least part of evolution, but nothing has ever come close to falsifying the whole. Occasionally, yes, we need to rework a previous understanding of some aspects of evolution, but the fact that evolution happens is one of the most well-established scientific facts of our time. The belief that somehow billions of years ago, some simple form of microscopic life arose on Earth through materialistic physical means, and then over the eons that followed, that life evolved and advanced in complexity through blind, directionless processes into the stunning array of life forms that we see on Earth today, including human beings, all without the intervention of God or any other intelligent creator, that is a central pillar of dogma in the halls of science today. It most certainly is not. Firstly, the origin of life, abiogenesis, is not included in the theory of evolution, though they are certainly related in the sense that evolution can't happen until life exists. Now, how that life came to exist is ultimately irrelevant to evolution as long as it did happen. Secondly, I'd like to know what mechanisms you are proposing for the origin of life that are not materialistic or physical. I mean, even the creation story has God physically and materially building his Adam golem and then physically breathing the breath of life into him, and then physically removing his rib and molding a woman out of it. Sure, this isn't naturalistic, as the exact mechanisms by which God breathing into someone's nose brings them to life remain a complete mystery, but it's still described very physically. Thirdly, blind directionless processes is not an entirely accurate description for the development of complexity. Increased complexity is actually predicted by the theory of evolution because of competition for scarce resources. In fact, evolution predicts that organisms will gradually evolve to needless amounts of complexity in order to outcompete other organisms. That's why trees are tall. A tree doesn't need to be tall to get closer to the sun for more energy, it just needs to be taller than its neighbor. But we have some ridiculously tall trees where the majority of its resources are spent building a trunk that is entirely unnecessary. Now sure, it does need to get taller than its neighbor, but if its neighbor had a shorter trunk too, it wouldn't need to get so tall to outcompete its neighbor. Selection pressures provide the direction for these processes, which I suppose could be considered blind in that they aren't conscious decisions, but rather the result of which organisms can survive and reproduce in which environments. 
But yes, the stunning array of life forms that we see today are the result of specialization for the purpose of using and obtaining resources competitively. And since there are plenty of religious scientists all over the world, with some areas showing scientists with a greater tendency toward religiosity than the general population, I'm gonna just go ahead and say that not believing God had anything to do with anything is not a central dogma for science. If we look further into the survey, we find that in every region surveyed, the majority of scientists all agree that there is no conflict between science and religion, with most either answering that they are independent of each other or that they are complementary. And to question evolution is to invite derision and censure as a heretic. No, you're more than welcome to question it. It's just that at this point, it has so much evidence backing it up that you would need to rework our entire understanding of everything biology related in order to replace it. And usually with things like this, we can tell in advance that our theory is incomplete. We know that relativity doesn't quite work to explain everything that it should explain. It's not that relativity is wrong, it's more that it is an incomplete explanation, but the point is that we know that there are scenarios in which relativity is inadequate, which is why we are looking to develop a theory of quantum gravity. And relativity was developed because Newtonian physics were incomplete, and were known to be incomplete several decades before Einstein developed his theory of relativity to replace it. Questioning the accepted explanations for phenomena is one of the main ways we make scientific progress. It is an essential part of science. Your claim of the exact opposite is entirely unfounded. And yet question it many do. Not just the religious, but scientists and atheists too, and for scientific reasons. Not really. I have never seen a truly secular organization dedicated to convincing people to deny evolution. But there are plenty of religious ones. As merely one example, in his 2012 book Mind and Cosmos, atheist Thomas Nagel, who certainly believes in no god whatsoever. Before we get into what this quote actually is, I'd just like to point out that he just finished explaining that there are scientists who deny evolution for scientific reasons. And then as an example, he pulls out Thomas Nagel, the philosopher. No specialization in biology, just philosophy. This is not an attempt to deride philosophy in general, but you'd think that if there are so many atheist scientists who deny evolution for scientific reasons, you'd lead with one of them rather than a philosopher. It is prima facie highly implausible that life as we know it is the result of a sequence of physical accidents together with the mechanism of natural selection. Well, before I even begin to examine the context of this quote, let me just point out that prima facie basically means based on first impressions. So it looks like he's setting up a scenario where it may look highly implausible, but a more in-depth explanation reveals that it is not implausible. In that book, in the introduction, he is pointing out that the purpose of his book is to understand the cosmos based on the framework of materialist reductionism. To quote him earlier in this book, this is just the opinion of a layman who reads widely in the literature that explains contemporary science to the non-specialist. He fully acknowledges a lack of expertise on the subject matter. And after looking at the context of the quote a bit, I find that you're not entirely misrepresenting his position. But his position is itself a misrepresentation of our current understandings of science. My skepticism is not based on religious belief or on a belief in any definite alternative. It is just a belief that the available scientific evidence, in spite of the consensus of scientific opinion, does not in this matter rationally require us to subordinate the incredulity of common sense. See? He's basically flat out saying that he is going against the scientific consensus based on an appeal to common sense. Common sense, though, is basically just an amalgamation of our various biases. Something seems to make common sense if it fits in with your current framework and previously understood conclusions. At best, common sense is confirmation bias. At worst, it's just flat out wrong. And Dr. Nagel's appeal to common sense, to me, suggests a misunderstanding of how science operates, as common sense is something that is detrimental to the scientific method. The first dangerous law of evolution that we'll discuss today is that man is merely another animal. Harmful or not, that is not a lie, it is a fact. Human beings are eukaryotic, that is, their cells have a nucleus that's contained in a membrane. Humans are heterotrophic, meaning they cannot manufacture their own nutrients through carbon fixation, but instead have to eat. 
Humans are motile, that is, capable of motion. They have sensory organs, their cells do not have a cell wall, and they grow from a blastula during embryonic development. The definition of animal is a eukaryotic multicellular organism that is heterotrophic, motile, and has specialized sensory organs, lacks a cell wall, and grows from a blastula during embryonic development. Do you disagree with this assessment? Because each one of these characteristics is a well-established, demonstrable fact. And if I wanted to, I could go into more detail here. There are more characteristics, and some of the characteristics are not universally applicable to all animals, but are more general. But the thing is, even for these more general characteristics, they all obviously apply to humans, one example being that they reproduce sexually. There are definite examples of animals that do not, but generally, animals do reproduce sexually. And obviously, that's how humans reproduce. The motile one is another generalization, but I don't think you would argue that humans are incapable of movement. Humans are, by definition, animals. If you don't like that, or the consequences that come from that, then tough luck for you, but it is a fact. But feel free to try and provide a useful alternate definition of animal that actually includes traits that encompasses everything that is actually an animal, while specifically excluding humans without the exclusion being completely arbitrary. You won't be able to do it, because humans are animals. This sort of thinking has led to complete lunacy. It really hasn't, though. But even if it had, you'd actually have to demonstrate that it is a false statement before you can say that it's a lie. In December of 2013, an organization called the Non-Human Rights Project filed lawsuits in New York City in which the claimed plaintiffs were four chimpanzees seeking to give the chimps legal rights under the 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution and the full status of autonomous legal Persons. Animal rights activists are a thing. Okay, that's nice. Animal rights activists have been doing stuff like this for ages now. Would you prefer to go back to the 1800s when people like P.T. Barnum were free to train elephants by shoving red-hot pokers up their trunks? Sure, we can disagree about how far these rights should extend, but your utter contempt for the idea of treating animals better seems to be the consequence of the dangerous creationist lie that human beings are somehow placed above the animals. Of the same spirit, Ingrid Newkirk, one of the co-founders of PETA, or the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, famously stated, Animal liberationists do not separate out the human animal, so there is no rational basis for saying that a human being has special rights. A rat is a pig, is a dog, is a boy. And you'll find vegans that are often harshly critical of PETA. Sure, you can get silly statements from the extremists. That's easy to do. This would be the equivalent of me playing the clip of Matt Powell talking about how he knows that the sun is young because the air in space is different than the air we have here, and then attributing that belief to all creationists. But in space, wouldn't it be a different scenario based on the fact that, you know, the, 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 the space and the air in the space is much different than the air we have here? Would you like me to start doing that? You need to explain the process by which the sun burns using the air in space, or creationism is false. God's word declares that mankind is created in the very image of God himself. Yeah, it does. And as we have seen, that is a dangerous creationist lie that has led people to put too much stock into the importance of humanity over everything else on the planet, to the point where there is a very intense correlation between climate change denial and religious belief. As you yourself pointed out earlier in a section that, I, I think I skipped it actually, beliefs have consequences. As society increasingly accepts the evolutionary lie that we're merely animals, our civilization has increasingly descended into a society of animals. What does that even mean? Like, I know it's that line about teaching a kid that they're an animal, then don't be surprised when they start acting like one. Well, I think we could all learn some good behavior from dogs. We could learn to chill out and not let things bother us, like cats. We could do with some teamwork, like some species of ants. Hell, Christians want us to be God's sheep so that God can be our shepherd. And I couldn't tell you how many Christian self-help books that specifically are aimed at men tell men to be more like lions. My point is, there are traits that various animals have that Christians agree would be good traits for humans to also have, and they teach you that you should have them. So is behaving like an animal really such a bad thing? 
This is just one of those statements that sounds good superficially, maybe, but if you think about it for more than a split second, it just completely falls apart. Where we follow nothing but the dictates of our own instincts and desires, our own wants and hungers crowd out any concerns of the wants and needs of others. Ah, so the specific trait you're talking about is selfishness, a trait that is by no means universal among animals, and a trait which is generally frowned upon even by us godless atheists who point out that humans are animals by definition. Now, I don't like to toot my own horn when it comes to charitable donations, but I give enough money to charity that I get warnings from my tax software every year about how deducting such a large percentage of my income as charitable donations is suspicious and could trigger an audit. I live in a mostly Christian country. Christians are supposed to give 10% of their income to charity. That's about what I donate and have for years now. If Christians were doing the Christian thing and actually donating 10% of their income, then that would be considered the norm and would not be cause for an audit. And I know plenty of atheists who do a lot more for charity than I do. Generally, I just give money, but I don't give my time because I'm selfish. Giving money is easy. Giving time is hard. But most of the atheists that I associate with are incredibly generous with their time when it comes to charity work, and they aren't stingy with the cash either. So in my experience, those of us who have the means to help others are more than happy to do so, even though we all agree that humans are animals. So try again. The second lie we'll examine is this. There is no absolute standard of morality. While I would agree that there is no absolute standard of morality, I disagree that this is a conclusion drawn from the theory of evolution. While evolution does have the ability to explain how our senses of morality developed, the existence or non-existence of an absolute standard of morality is ultimately completely irrelevant to evolution. God is good. God is love. And as our creator, God commands us to be like him. Ah, that explains all the genocide throughout history then, I guess. God did a big one once, so now humans can find justifications for doing smaller ones, right? Because we are made in the image of God, and God commands us to be like him. Beliefs and ideas have consequences, remember? As Jesus commands us in Matthew 5 and verse 48, you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. Well, right now, for me, what would be perfect is a cup of tea. Does that mean that I need to be a cup of tea? Or that you need to be one? Perfect by itself doesn't really mean much. Perfect is a word that we use to describe the qualities something actually has when compared to the qualities that we want it to have. Perfect is not an absolute standard. It is entirely relative and subjective. The perfect music to listen to depends entirely on your mood and preferences. Sometimes it might be You Waste Your Time by Mark Tremonti. Sometimes it might be Chopin's Prelude in E Minor, which has actually been described as the perfect piece of music. Except, no, that's not quite right. It was described as the perfect teaching tool for music. So it's perfect for a specific purpose. And if you want to know why, I really highly recommend a video on a channel called Sideways that basically explains how edging makes music good, and how the popularity of the four chord structure in a lot of modern music, everything from pop music to film scores, is essentially eliminating the edging and just giving you your musical dopamine fix every eight seconds or so. But also, your understanding of the musical composition can actually affect the ability to appreciate the music itself. It's a fascinating video, I highly recommend it. In his word, he shows us how providing us the law, the Ten Commandments, as well as the teachings and the living example of His Son, Jesus Christ. Okay, so what are we to do about that time when Jesus got the Ten Commandments wrong? You know, in Mark 10, 19, when Jesus added, do not defraud to the commandments? And yeah, sure, use whatever apologetic you want in order to make that not a misquote, but the author of Matthew thought Jesus was wrong about that one too, so when he copied the story out, he took out the do not defraud one. And then, of course, there's the fact that the Ten Commandments and the laws are far from perfect and condone some pretty nasty stuff like slavery, rape as a property crime. Honor your father and your mother sounds good superficially, but implicit there is that even if they are abusive, you have to honor them, as there is no recourse described in the Bible for the child of abusive parents. 
But while the Bible didn't go out of its way to explicitly condemn things like rape, slavery, and child abuse, it did go out of its way to make sure that we all know that it's wrong to boil a baby goat in its mother's milk. And yes, there are some decent rules in the Bible as well, like don't murder and don't steal, but my point here is that the perfect law is, in reality, not even close to perfect. The very existence of apologetics as a field of study for explaining away the obvious immoralities contained within the law itself is a demonstration of the imperfection of the law. If God wrote his morality on our hearts like the Bible says he did, and if the law is perfect like you say it is, then we should all just be able to read the law in the Bible and agree that, yeah, it's pretty good. But instead, we have people who make entire careers out of explaining why the obviously immoral parts of the law actually weren't all that bad if you think about it. God condemns lying. He condemns murder. He commands us to be 100% faithful to our husbands or wives. No, not really. I mean, yes, the wives have to be faithful, but when looking at the cultural and historical context, adultery is all about the woman in the marriage relationship, not the man. Now, if a man sleeps with another man's wife, then they both have committed adultery and must be put to death. But pretty much all the heroes of the Old Testament have multiple wives and concubines, and not a word is said about it being an immoral practice. And in fact, there are rules about how you are allowed to have multiple wives as long as you don't deny one of your wives her marital rights. Sure, the New Testament did gently suggest that one wife is best, with its rules for deacons and elders, and a passage in 1 Corinthians that can easily be interpreted as suggesting that one spouse is best, but why the change of heart? I'm willing to grant that 1 Corinthians actually does condemn polygamy, even though it would be easy to interpret it otherwise, because the culture at the time had come to frown on polygamy, so it is most likely actually condemning it. But the Old Testament explains the ground rules for how one is to engage in polygamy. Why the change? I thought this was the perfect moral law book. Anywho, all this to say that, at least in the Old Testament, wives had to remain faithful to their husbands, but the husbands were free to muck about as long as the woman he was mucking about with wasn't already married to someone else. To love our neighbor as ourselves. Every Hebrew scholar I've heard speak on the matter makes it quite clear that in the Old Testament, neighbor refers to your fellow Hebrews. Case in point, where do you get your permanent slaves from? The nations around you, but don't rule over your fellow Israelites harshly. So yeah, love your neighbor as yourself, but neighbors are only other members of your own tribe. The God of biblical Christianity absolutely does prescribe an absolute moral code. So you assert. But I point out that his moral code is immoral in several places, and most Christians agree with me. Otherwise, apologetics wouldn't exist to explain why it's not immoral because of the situation, or the culture, or the time, or whatever other excuse they have. But if the apologists are right, and there are situations in which genocide or slavery can be moral, then that pretty much definitionally means that these moral laws can't actually be absolute, as the morality of the laws depends entirely on the situation and culture. And he holds mankind, his creation, accountable to that moral code for our own good and benefit. He'll send you to hell for your own good. Yet as many have noted, Taken to its rational conclusions, in a world of only material causes, the theory of evolution tells us that no such divine, objective, and absolute standard of morality exists. No, evolution does not teach that. The fact that allele frequencies in a population will shift over time has nothing to do with the existence or non-existence of some absolute moral code. At its core, evolution is a heartless and merciless concept. At its core, gravity is also heartless and merciless. Gravity don't give a crap about you. It'll make you fall down those stairs or off that cliff. It'll bring down that plane full of passengers. So much death caused by gravity. But you know what? Life wouldn't actually be able to exist without it, so it's kind of a compromise. Well, you know what else? Same goes for evolution. No, it doesn't care about you just like gravity doesn't, but life as we know it would not be possible without it. The idea that life advances only as the strong dominates the weak. That is an absolutely infantile misunderstanding of what evolution is. It's about which individuals are better able to survive and reproduce. 
Sometimes that is the strong surviving and the weak dying off, but other times it's the cowardly individual who's better at hiding who survives and then can go on to reproduce. Other times it's the sneaky individual who will sneak past the stronger dominant male and covertly mate with the females that are in that male's territory. Some male cuttlefish actually pretend to be female cuttlefish in order to accomplish this. He draws in his tentacles to look like a female. My point is, there are a plethora of survival and mating strategies that do not involve just being stronger. And yet, apart from a living God, what is the common good? It's the greatest good for the greatest number of people, obviously. What does a God have to do with that? We can tell what's good for us without God having to point it out first. I know what I dislike, and I recognize that there are some likes and dislikes that are shared by most people, so we decide to make laws to punish certain behaviors that we deem to be bad. It's really quite simple, and it's more than a little alarming that such a large percentage of the population insists that they need to be told by God that murder is wrong, that they don't know it for themselves, and can't comprehend how anyone could possibly figure it out without a God. Just as torturing a child for fun is and always will be, an act of evil. Ah, there it is again. If only I had a dollar for every time an apologist used the torturing children line, but had to add for fun as a modifier in order to avoid the obvious complication of their god torturing children in hell. Do we understand that torturing babies for fun is really wrong? The implication of the for fun modifier suggests that you could conceive of a scenario in which torturing children is morally acceptable as long as the person doing the torturing is not enjoying themselves. Is that a position you like to hold? And yet this third lie is perhaps the most dangerous, the most devious, and the most damaging of them all. It is that man has no purpose. I mean, it depends entirely on what you mean by purpose, but I don't see how this would be the most insidious of the bunch. If I grant everything that you have said up to this point, I would be more concerned about the morality thing than whether or not there is an ultimate purpose to life, seeing as how morality is something that directly impacts my life as I live it, while purpose, if you mean what I think you mean by it, isn't even something that is up to me. Why were you born? Why were any of us born? Well, you see, when a man and a woman love each other very much, or at least sexually attracted to each other... What is our reason for being alive? Whatever you want it to be. I don't need a god to give me a purpose, I can choose my own purpose. Why does mankind exist? Why do I exist? You know, we, we do know what causes babies nowadays. If you haven't figured that out yet, then I can only assume that you were educated in the United States, probably somewhere in the Bible Belt. Okay, that's not fair. The U.S. isn't the only country in the world that neglects its sex education. They're just one of the best at it. What is my purpose for being and the meaning of my life? As an atheist, I get to choose that for myself. Fun fact, though, this one is also in no way relevant to evolution. As I pointed out earlier, plenty of Christians accept evolution, even some who use the word creationist to describe themselves. I doubt very much that such people would agree with your assessment that life is meaningless because it evolved. Now, many believers in evolution who long not to be expelled from the atheist paradise they believe evolution provides them, try to counter that you're free to decide your own purpose and to imagine your own meaning of life. Yes, your purpose in life is what you want it to be. The meaning of your life is what you make your life mean. This is far more empowering and inspiring than God says you need to be X. But in the end, this proves hollow and empty. It's working out pretty well for me so far. We don't want to fantasize about a meaning to our life. We have a need to know that our concept of the purpose of our life isn't subject to our flights of fancy. Why? If I receive new information about something that I had a strong opinion on to the point where I made it my life's mission, and then change my mind on that subject as a result of this new information, should I not be able to change my life's mission? The ability to change one's mind is an important part of life, in my opinion. If you have to stick to your guns no matter what new information you learn, that's a bad thing. But are rooted in something true, meaningful, and eternal. Being eternal actually takes your value away. 
Take a basic economics class sometime. Scarcity is one of the factors that determines value. Time is scarce. As such, it is valuable. But if you actually are going to exist for eternity, then time is the least valuable thing you have because you get an unlimited amount of it. Your time literally has no value, making your life here ultimately meaningless since you get an infinite supply of time once your life here is over. Atheism doesn't give you eternity. You have to make the best of the one life that you know for sure that you do get. So if taking away ultimate meaning and purpose is such a bad thing, it's religion that does that. Deep down, we know that if there's no objective, real meaning and purpose to our lives, in the end, we can't pretend otherwise. No, I don't know that deep down. And if you do, that's a you problem. But please, don't try and insist that you know what I know deep down. It's disingenuous and, frankly, condescending. In this need, however, evolution provides no comfort, according to some of its most ardent defenders. That's nice. Good thing the truth of a claim is not determined in any way by how much comfort it gives you. You know, the nonprofit organization Suicide.org has noted that the global suicide rate over the last 45 years has grown by 60%. Globally, maybe. I'm having a hard time pinning down the number. But in individual countries, there are several where suicide is on a downward trend, including the US, Canada, and the UK. I'm not going to speculate about the causes, but one thing is certain. If the teaching of evolution were actually causally linked to suicide, then you would expect the trends in these three countries to be going upward, not downward, because over the course of the 20th century, the teaching of evolution gradually became more prolific. No matter how you look at it, Evolution is not linked to suicide. Mankind needs purpose and hope. Is there any purpose or hope in being just a bit of pollution? Is there any meaning in being completely irrelevant? Bit of pollution and completely irrelevant were parts of a Lawrence Krauss quote that I skipped. And the answer is, of course, yes. Krauss was speaking of the universe as a whole. The universe itself doesn't care about us, and no matter what we do, we will not have anything even approaching a significant impact on the universe as a whole. That fact does not stop my life from having meaning to me and the lives of those around me having meaning to me and my life having meaning to them. It is possible to simultaneously care about people and recognize that the universe doesn't care about you. The rest of the video is just their preachy bit. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Xenobears, who says, Okay, let's say we teach creationism in school. Whose version of creation will we choose? McMurtry would obviously prefer the Christian story, but if we want to guarantee equality and fairness, we'd have to cover every major non-Abrahamic religion as well, and teach the critical thinking skills needed to impartially assess each. I couldn't agree more. If we could actually guarantee that teachers would do this properly, then I would fully agree with this method of teaching. Unfortunately, we can't actually guarantee that teachers will adhere to such policies. It's already hard enough to get them to not preach to kids in class as it is. Look for my ranting video about that one if it's not out already. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, Dry Jesus, and all the rest, who are the dangerous lies that keep my channel evolving. If you'd like to not actually be related to evolution more than just tangentially, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wish list, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time time.